Good morning and also good afternoon for those that are joining from Europe. I'm very pleased to chair this panel today at the online BCMI 2020 conference dedicated to challenges finding information in food and agriculture on the web. What can we do better? And this panel is going to focus on food and agricultural sciences. And as you will learn over the next 90 minutes, um, agriculture and disciplines related have special characteristics that make data interoperability particularly challenging. And so the work of search engines to collect scientific data. On one side, in these particular um, sciences, gray literature is crucial. While journal articles are not necessarily the only scholarly communication channel that counts. And secondly, and the most important, and that is going to be uh, very much highlighted today, is that while in other sciences, English is the pivotal language, in the case of the food and agriculture, and due to the diversity of languages behind used, it's necessary to consider multilinguism, multilinguism and semantic strategies as a way to increase accessibility to all the scientific literature produced. Um, we hope that at the end of this session, panelists will share some thoughts about possible ways to address some of the identified challenges, as well possible common synergies to build on how, uh, how to bring them forward. Today we have panelists from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, CGIR, Land Portal Foundation, USDA National Agricultural Library, and the Beijing Academy of Agriculture and Forestry Sciences that unfortunately is not going to be physically in this panel session due to time constraints, the time zone constraints, but we have a recording to present the use case that they would like to share with you about the work that they are doing in this field. We encourage to all of you to submit your questions through the chat box anytime. Don't be shy, just share. Uh, if you have any specific request for one panelist, please add her name at the beginning of your comments. This will make easy to go through the questions and answers part. And uh, don't forget that we would like to hear from you as well. This is an interactive session where we would like also to learn from your thoughts and experiences if you have any in this field or in any other field that you think that could be also of interest to the audience. So this panel will start with a short presentation by each of the panelists. And this is going to bring us uh, or to take uh, more or less 60 minutes. And after that, we will start with the questions and answers. But uh, before we continue with the session, let me introduce myself, uh, because of course, probably you don't know me at all. So I'm Ima Subirats. I'm a senior information management um, uh, at FAO, and I'm the program manager for Agris and Agrovolk, which will be also presented today during our discussion. Said that, you have here in the Zoom all the panelists. Um, we will start um, by the order that was uh, displayed in the announcement of this session. Therefore, I would like to introduce our first panelist, which is Erin Antonioli. Uh, Erin is coming from the USDA National Agricultural Library, NAL, and uh, she um, is uh, the lead metadata librarian and data curation team in the Knowledge Services Division of the USDA NAL. Thank you, Erin and you can share your presentation, it's over to you. Thank you, Emma, can you hear me? Perfectly, yeah, thank you. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, I'm here today to talk about the Ag Data Commons, USDA's general Ag Data Catalog and Repository, which is designed to help USDA researchers publish and disseminate data products. The National Agricultural Library is one of five national libraries of the United States. It houses one of the world's largest collections devoted to agriculture and its related sciences. NAL provides a variety of online resources, including journal articles, digital collections, and other materials relating to agriculture. I'm going to focus on the Ag Data Commons for today's presentation. The Ag Data Commons is a catalog and data repository for USDA-funded research data. 
It provides expert services for creating, curating, and enabling access to complete and machine-readable scientific metadata. It creates infrastructure for linking information, data, pro data, publications, people, and more. And it helps the USDA-funded research community meet public access requirements. An Ag Data Commons data set consists of data files and associated metadata. We provide tools and services to make each data set richer and more discoverable. The Ag Data Commons strives to deliver fair metadata that are machine readable and available via APIs and other automated means. As a generalist ag repository, we focus most heavily on the F and the A of this matrix, since interoperability and reusability generally require subject-specific adherence to more regimented data and metadata standards. To that end, the Ag Data Commons provides discovery and access as its core function. Search and discovery tools and linked information promote findability. We enable access through the catalog and public APIs, use of open licenses, and DOIs for digital assets. The Ag Data Commons synthesizes metadata to achieve a variety of services. I like the analogy of Lego blocks to represent Ag Data Commons metadata because the pieces come in different colors, shapes, and sizes, and can be assembled in a variety of ways to perform a variety of functions. Our metadata system is no different. We ask for essential information about the data and rearrange that input to satisfy the needs of each service that the Ag Data Commons offers. We often work with geospatial metadata, which must use the ISO 19115 standard. And this standard underpins our internal systems because it's robust enough to handle the information from the other standards. One use case that illustrates this metadata synthesis includes our work with the AgCross repository. AgCross specializes in geospatial data and uses an ISO 19115 flavor of metadata in an ESRI platform. We ingest metadata and data by harvesting from AgCross using microservices architecture according to best practices and create the Ag Data Commons record and store the data files locally. We then reformat that metadata to the data site format and reserve a DOI using an internal system, which then gets added back to the Ag Data Commons record. Finally, the DOI is pushed back to AgCross for display with their record using a RESTful API. Records tagged with specific bureau codes are also forwarded to data.gov. This way, AgCross researchers can utilize their subject-specific platform, but also benefit from the discovery and access services the Ag Data Commons offers. We offer a wide assortment of fields to data submitters with a great deal of linking potential, but we need to strike a balance between information that makes data fair and how much data submitters are willing to fill out. When we present too many requirements, people simply won't fill out, the, they simply just won't submit their data, or they opt for repositories with a lower bar of entry. When we allow submissions with too few completed fields, the data set findability and potential reusability suffers. After reviewing the requirements for the services Ag Data Commons facilitates, we arrived at this core set of essential metadata for each record. This list doesn't account for some of the subject-specific requirements certain research communities may need, but we cover our bases as a generalist ag catalog with this set of metadata. During the curation process, our staff also adds NAL thesaurus terms to Ag Data Commons records. The NAL thesaurus is used to select controlled vocabulary terms for subject indexing in several of the library's databases. The thesaurus is produced in part by the National Agricultural Library, is updated annually, and contains over 260,000 terms. It's available as linked open data for anyone to use. The Ag Data Commons provides the infrastructure for linking metadata and objects to enable analytical tools. We provide specific fields for these relationships to maximize the linking and machine readability of the metadata. This includes different types of relationships between datasets and documentation, 
author identification links like ORCID, and version guidance. We provide features to promote credit for USDA researchers as an incentive to deposit data with us and to provide more complete records with linked information. US federal data should be openly and freely available, but the Ag Data Commons makes it easier for researchers to give and receive credit for their work. Citations are automatically generated for all records in the catalog and researchers can link to their scholarly publications, data papers, and other related content. We also provide DOIs for locally held data files, which has been a big incentive for researchers to share their data publicly. Now, as much as we do well, there are still plenty of challenges we face in making data findable and accessible. Our search features offer a particular opportunity for improvement. We've been working with our stakeholders to develop search requirements to use while we evaluate database platforms for our 2021 upgrade. Our data content represents a diverse set of research topics and metadata needs. We can't be all things to all people and instead focus on the services we offer and the metadata required to accomplish those tasks. An AL thesaurus application is not currently automated and that's a problem. We plan to work more closely with NAL's indexing and informatics branch to improve NALT term application and provide better linkage between various library systems. And yet another challenge involves which controlled vocabularies to implement and how to link them to authoritative sources. We chose taxonomies related directly to NAL's services, but seek a better and more effective way to integrate controlled vocabularies used by the different subject specific areas we support. Our metadata enriches our data sets, but doesn't always make them more discoverable outside of our own platform. Some of this relates to infrastructure and some to culture. For instance, ORCID accounts can automatically link data sets with DOIs we issue from their author profile pages, but many account holders don't turn on that feature. We can capture rich information, but strive to increase the linked information we provide. To that end, we work to convey the value of linked information to the researchers submitting the data. More fields often represents more burden for data submitters, so we look for ways to make the submission process easier and to communicate the added value. As information professionals, we understand how complete and linked information enhances data sets. However, to get the absolute most utility out of data sets, we must educate submitters and communicate the value of linked information while lessening the submission burden so data becomes more easily findable and accessible. Thank you. Um, that's my presentation. Here are a few of the links that I um, showed throughout my presentation and I will hand it back to Emma. Thank you so much, Erin, also for really doing on time. Very interesting presentation. I would like to bring on board our next panelist, um, Fabrizio Celli. Um, Fabrizio is part of um, the team that is managing Agri AGRIS, the International System for Agricultural Science and Technology. Actually, he is the technical leader and uh, he is working for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. We'll come to the panel, Fabrizio, and over to you. Thank you very much, Emma. Okay, uh, in this session, uh, uh, we will be looking uh, at how AGRIS is addressing uh, challenges in finding and uh, integrating uh, research uh, in food uh, and agriculture. I want to give you some background about uh, FAO and uh, AGRIS. FAO uh, is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and it's the organization that is maintaining AGRIS. Uh, FAO's goal uh, is to uh, lead the international efforts to defeat hunger and to improve nutrition and food security. It was founded in 1945 and the headquarter is in Rome, even if FAO operates in over 130 countries. In 1974, uh, FAO set up an initiative uh, together with the uh, member countries uh, to uh, make information on agriculture globally available. 
the outcome of this initiative uh, was AGRIS. AGRIS uh, is a, a database um, of almost 12 million of multilingual bibliographic metadata on agricultural research. But it is also a big network of, uh, um, as you can see, 434 data providers from 150 countries. Uh, the uh, importance of Agris is also given by the fact that it's highly used. Uh, so according to Google Analytics, uh, Agris receives around 8 million of visits per month uh, and is accessed from all over the world, uh, 200 countries and uh, territories. Before talking about uh, uh, the new challenges that Agris uh, has to address, uh, uh, I want to sh I want to describe a little bit how uh, the data providers, the Agris data providers, changed over the time. So at the beginning, uh, in 1974, uh, governments uh, des uh, designated uh, official Agris centers whose role was to collect all the scientific production in their country and to send the data to Agris. Then, uh, uh, from 2005, uh, Agris uh, started to accept uh, also data from institutional repositories, from publishers, and from aggregators. Usually, in this case, Agris doesn't go to an institution and ask for data, but thanks to the visibility that Agris has, uh, institutions come to Agris uh, uh, asking if they can publish data. And uh, we can face here problems uh, of uh, integration of the data. On the other hand, uh, uh, with the evolution of the technology uh, and also of the open access institutional repositories, uh, Agris uh, uh, has to cope uh, also with problems related to automatic uh, discovery, automatic harvesting and processing of data and metadata available on the web. So just to summarize, uh, uh, there are two big uh, areas in terms of challenges. Uh, on one side, we have the problem of the integration of new data. So when there is a new data provider, there are several problems uh, to be solved uh, in order to guarantee that the metadata can be correctly published in Agris and that can benefit of all the features that give a lot of visibility to Agris data. So for example, uh, considering uh, the variety of the data providers and the fact that they come from all over the world, uh, they always use different metadata formats and different standards. And most important, uh, uh, there are very different levels of metadata quality. So while there are data providers uh, who has made a very rich metadata records, uh, on the other hand, uh, we can find uh, some data providers uh, with very poor records. And this, of course, creates a problem of uh, balance inside the Agris database. Other issues are, for example, related to the full text links and also the stability of the links. Agris uh, uh, always suggests to add the link to the full text. But uh, considering that Agris, uh, the Agris started in 1974, most of the links uh, are corrupted. So Agris needs to periodically review all the links to guarantee that they are still working. Then uh, the other important problem is about uh, multilingualism. In fact, uh, uh, considering that Tigris has metadata in up to 90 languages, uh, the pro some problems can, uh, um, can exist when Agris receives records, especially with text encoding. Uh, everybody should use uh, Unicode, UTF-8, uh, in order to guarantee uh, interoperability of uh, the metadata in all the languages. The second area is about the automatic discovery and the ingestion of data directly from web APIs, for example, using the OAI PMH protocol or using like RESTful APIs. Uh, two big problems here are the relevance of high volume data. In fact, when you uh, search for data on the web and you want to automatically uh, harvest and ingest data into the database, it is difficult to be sure about the relevance. So uh, the fact that the data is relevant to the topics available in the Agris database. The second issue is related to content classification and to the integration of uh, this data automatically harvested from the web. Now about the data integration, Agris uh, has set up an orchestration of uh, 
uh, software components, even if at the beginning we have a, a manual validation of the metadata. So the, there is a physical person who receives the metadata and checks the metadata uh, for, uh, in order to understand if, first of all, it is relevant to the aggregate domain. And second, if uh, um, there are semantic errors, for example, or problems with encoding. This is something that is possible for regular data providers, but not uh, when metadata are automatically harvested from the web, because there the volume of the data is very high and it's impossible to do this manually. Uh, after this is done, uh, uh, Agris has a lot of processes to convert and harmonize uh, all the metadata from a lot of formats to an Agris internal format, which is Agris AP, and then to perform some operations like data cleaning and metadata enrichment in order to reach the final version of uh, the, the record, which is the Agris RDF. So uh, this uh, allows Agris to enable the usage of linked open data technologies. So Agris uh, is not uh, giving any suggestions in terms of uh, input uh, metadata format. Uh, Agris tries to accept everything, even if there are several challenges here, poor metadata, so like uh, missing metadata fields, uh, lack, for example, of controlled vocabularies, wrong usage of metadata properties, and as I told you, in case of multilingual records, also problems with encodings. This is why Agris uh, uh, recommends uh, to consider the Lode BD recommendations, uh, which are recommendations in terms of uh, uh, metadata properties to use, uh, and also in terms of uh, vocabularies to use. Uh, and uh, they can help to standardize uh, a little bit uh, uh, the situation and to help the integration of the metadata coming from uh, such a variety of data providers. Uh, of course, uh, it's important to build also some capacity develop, uh, de development. Uh, this is uh, because Agris uh, has learned a lot over the time and uh, the only way to help data providers uh, to produce better metadata is to uh, train also data providers. So the first step is email exchange. So when there are new data providers and uh, Agris understands that there are errors uh, or semantic errors or other kind of problems, uh, there is a, a chain of email exchange with the data provider to guide the data provider to produce better, uh, richer and meaningful metadata. Then there are also webinars, guides on the websites and uh, recommendations, as I told you before with the lot of BD recommendations. Now, an important uh, piece of the Agris infrastructure is Agrovoc. This is a controlled vocabulary covering all the areas of interest of FAO. It's translated into 39 languages uh, and uh, it's the backbone of Agris. So this is used, for example, to help Agris uh, with automatic data discovery and classification. Agrovoc, in fact, is used uh, within some machine learning algorithms uh, uh, that allows Agris to understand the relevance of the metadata, which are automatically harvested and downloaded the, from the web. Plus, uh, Agrovoc uh, is also very important to enable a lot of additional features on the website, like the multilingual search, like the improvement of the precision and the recall, like the possibility to connect uh, different resources, so using linked open data technologies. And as I told you also uh, in uh, several machine learning algorithms, both to determine the relevance of harvested resources, but also to classify resources according, using uh, this multilingual thesaurus. And uh, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. So we move uh, now to our third uh, speaker, uh, Xiao Ying Ping, is from the Institute of Agricultural Information and Economics at the Beijing Academy of Agricultural and Forestry Sciences. She's the responsible for the construction of agricultural information resources, data sharing, information analysis and semantic technology, technology research. As I mentioned before, unfortunately, she, is, um, she couldn't attend this panel session. Um, I'm not sure whether you can all, all of you can, share, can see the video. Yes? Okay, could you confirm as well that the, you can hear the sound? Hi, yes. I'm Chi Xiao Jing from. Okay, so I will put the video now. It's about uh, nine minutes, and then we will move to the next panelist. China. Great honor to have this opportunity to communicate with you. 
Now, I would like to introduce uh, some of the work our team has done for the construction and sharing of agricultural information resources, challenges, and how to deal with these challenges in the future. First, a brief introduction to my organization. PAFS was founded in 1958. It's a comprehensive agricultural research institution in Beijing. There are 14 specialized research institutes, and the business fields cover all aspects of agriculture. There are more than 1,000 employees. AIE is a specialized research institute under BAFS. It mainly carries out research and extension service in the field of agricultural information resource construction, agricultural information technology, agricultural economic management, etc. Our team has been engaged in the construction of agricultural information resources, data sharing, and information analysis for nearly two decades. We set up the Beijing Agriculture Think Tank platform in 2017. The goal of this platform is to build a resources rich, well organized, and functional agriculture science and technology service platform to provide data sharing service and in depth information analysis service for decision makers, managers, and researchers. We have been working towards this goal. At present, the platform has gathered more than 1 million pieces of agricultural information resources from China, other countries, and a few international organizations. According to the resource tabs, the platform brings together 12 categories of information resources, including patents, news, policies, etc. According to the agriculture theme, the data is divided into seed industry, planting industry, animal husbandry, fishery, etc. At the present, the resources is mainly in Chinese and English. Resources formats include text, PDF, numeric values, and so on. There are four main channels for data acquisition. One is the internal data of BAFS. BAFS owns a lot of primary data resources, such as expert information, technology achievement, research report. Another one is the data from the government and the academic association. We get it through comparative construction, data exchange, and so on. Certainly, the open data from the internet. The last one is the commercial databases. I think a good resource sharing platform should have several characteristics. Abundant in resources. Authority, authoritative and reliable, timely in update, standardized, good in continuity for data special prediction and data organization. With data and semantic are key. With data can change the chaotic data into standardized and available data. Uh, facilitated uh, data management and uh, data quality assessment, facilitated data integrate and sharing. Semantic uh, te technology can deeply digest and many um, potential relationship among data and uh, can be applied uh, can be applied to resource retrieval, resource recommendation, data association, data discovery. We have also have done some preliminary work in the regard. Metadata standards has been established to standardize the data processing and management. A core metadata model of agricultural information resource data set is established by fully considering 
and the metadata content necessary for data content, data display, data management, etc., including uh, include the title, subject, abstract, uh, keyword type, provider, uh, etc. On the basis of common metadata, different uh, data is extend and add their own unique metadata fields so as to form the metadata standard of this database, such as the science and the technology project database implies the project committed and unit, funding amount and project time, etc. In the end, we direct uh, 12 types of metadata standards. When resources are collected on a platform, they are converted into standardized data and stored uh, into in the database through format conversion, da uh, data cleaning, metadata attribute extraction, metadata extension, and other procedures. ST course is adopted as the base vocabulary of knowledge organization. ST course is a super vocabulary of science technology uh, added by NSTL, CAS, STSC, CAMS, CAS. Currently, ST course has collected more than 240,000 agricultural terms and more than 90,000 concepts. ST course is used in platform data retrieval and keyword extraction. Challenges. Agricultural information resources are limited, and the China's agricultural information resources are the main resources. Data for, uh, formats are varied, and most are not submitted according to the metadata standards. Poor metadata qualities, abstract keywords, themes, uh, etc., are often missing. Are often missing. Metadata attribute error, a low level of automatic and artificial intelligence. In data cleaning, metadata attribute extraction, extension, and other aspects still need plenty of manual uh, participation. Multi-legal multi problems, platform including includes Chinese, English, and other languages. So it is difficult to uh, achieve the unified resource retrieval and the data association of uh, multiple languages. Future plan carry out extensive uh, co cooperation with more organizations to realize the uh, mutual sharing of agricultural information resources, strengthen the research and application of AI technology in abstract uh, extensive. Ex extraction, uh, automatic uh, tagging of uh, keyword subject classification, and so on. Try to achieve a uh, multi language unified uh, retrieval and uh, intelligent re recommend recommendation based on agri work. Strengthen the research and application of uh, semantic knowledge, organizing technology, and uh, look forward to completing with our peers. This is the end of my speech. Thank you for your listening. Thank you so much for our panelists in Beijing, and I'm really sorry that she couldn't make it. In any case, if you have any question for her and for Bafs, sorry. sorry, this is, yeah. So if you have any question, a specific question for, for her, please uh, don't, don't, don't hesitate to write it back in the chat box. I, I could um, simply send this to them. And I would like to welcome our next panelist. Um, this is uh, Meda Devare. She is a senior research fellow at IFPRI. This is the International Food Policy Research Institute. Meda leads one of the three models of the CGIR platform for big data and agriculture, spearheading efforts to operationalize the fair principles towards bendable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data across the CGIR's uh, 13 centers. Thank you for being here, Meda, and over to you. Thanks, Ima, and um, thanks to the organizers for having me. 
let me know if you can't hear me clearly or if you're, um, something goes awry with the screen sharing. But you should be able to see my screen now, hopefully, correct? Yes. OK, yes. good. Good. Um, so I'm going to launch right in. Uh, first of all, I'm going to acknowledge my co-authors who could not be here, uh, Sotiris and Pythagoras from uh, SAIO, and they have helped us uh, greatly with this. And a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is, in fact, thanks to them. Uh, let me start in with an introduction like the others have given about CGIR, because I'm not sure how many people know uh, that CGIR is uh, uh, a network of 15 um, research for development centers focused mostly in the global south. It is the largest global agricultural innovation network. And um, we, so I mentioned the 15 centers. We, we have a local presence in over 100 countries, most of those countries uh, with GDPs of less than a dollar a day. Um, we've been around for, uh, most, of, most of the centers have been around for about 50 years. Um, and we have large uh, networks of partnerships. Um, we also have uh, uh, some of the, the, the work that we do is across uh, our gene banks, which hold or are stewards of, of um, a very large number of crop uh, seed, essentially accessions, is germplasm accessions. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, that's, that's really CGIR. What, what we focus on really is uh, poverty reduction, particularly in rural areas. Um, uh, we work on, on issues related to food, food um, security and, and nutritional security. And we try to do that in, in a sort of a, uh, an environmentally sustainable way uh, with, with regard for natural resource management um, and ecosystem services. Um, so, so that's just to sort of set the stage a little bit on what CGIR is. Uh, as we work um, in our centers, what we find is, as, as everybody here has, I think, alluded to, is, a, is an increasingly digitized and digital agriculture. So this is sort of a conceptual model of a, of a feature farm, uh, not, not in the US or in Europe, but actually in, in uh, Africa somewhere, or it could be South Asia. This is really where um, things are going, very digital. Uh, many of the speakers have mentioned uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, I come from the big data platform where we have the technologies to be deriving um, insights and solutions from data, large pools of data, in fact. Uh, but to do that, we need to be able to find and access the data, something you've heard about in earlier uh, presentations as well. We need to be able to interpret that data, not just as humans, but as machines as well. Uh, we increasingly need to be able to aggregate large amounts of uh, related data sets. Uh, and we, we generally need to be able to visualize, map, uh, and of course, analyze that data to derive insights from it. So that's kind of the, the, the scenario that we work in. And for the big data platform, one of the things that we're trying to do is assume open, uh, open access to our data, our research data by default, but focus on fair data. And I don't think I need to go much more into what fair is. Um, other people have mentioned this. What I'm showing you here is sort of our kind of overall approach to doing this. Um, this is a schematic that shows uh, the, the organized modules uh, uh, efforts to make data open and fair. And, 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 and so the heart of this is the Guardian Data Discovery Portal, which enables um, sort of wider discovery and use by Google datasets, for instance, uh, and other search engines uh, by external apps for farmers and policymakers. Um, and, and it does that by harvesting metadata from a number of different uh, uh, repositories. Or, or data platforms. And by data here, I mean both publications and data uh, platforms. So for CGIR centers, we have 15 centers, as I said, uh, that amounts to 30 odd repositories because each center typically tends to have, uh, unfortunately, a, a, a one data repository and one publications repository, typically unlinked. So you don't know what um, publication was built using what data very often. Um, so that's 30 repositories. We're also making data discoverable from USAID's uh, digital data library, from what used to be DFID, um, 
and I can never remember what that FCDO stands for, but it used to be DFID, uh, the, 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 the British equivalent uh, of USA, roughly speaking. We have some data and an uh, increasing amount of data and publications from the World Bank. Uh, we also make discoverable uh, what you, Aaron, Aaron talked about earlier, USDA's um, Ag Data Commons, and we have uh, the Genesis platform from our uh, uh, gene banks, which I've already mentioned. Um, earlier. We also have data uh, and publications visible from the Government of India's open data portal, focusing primarily on the ag part of that, because there's much more there. Um, and there's a dataverse sitting behind this uh, for those who want to upload their data. And for that, we have built workflows to comply with um, based on ontologies and control vocabularies that, that form the standard. So these workflows, we, the FAIR workflows, are intended to generate data that's, that's um, consistently described uh, in terms of the, the semantics of the data. And then uh, the, we're also developing digital tools to collect data that's already standards compliant, already built on ontologies and, and, and such. Um, and of course, the, 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 the primary piece of all of this is the so what, you can find data, so big deal. Um, and here, what I'm showing you is the, the sort of pipelines that we're building out uh, to be able to analyze the data, to visualize it and explore it, both semantically as well as um, uh, uh, visually in, in, in maps and being able to query it that way as well. So um, just a quick view of what this looks like. Uh, this is a search done in Guardian on, on the terms here are nutrition women. Uh, the idea is I want to find data on nutrition as it affects women. So I go to Guardian, I type in those keywords, and here you see a quick um, grab, um, which um, you see data coming from three of our CGIR centers, IFPRI, ILRI, and SIP, as well as FCDO, which used to be DFID, um, USAID's DDL, uh, data.gov.in, and you may not be able to see the bottom one, which is the World Bank. Um, there are a number of publications and data sets that are being discovered here. There's different ways to filter uh, across the top and, and, to, to, and to look at that data here. And of course, I did, I did mention USDA Ag Data Commons gene banks. If you go further down this, you're likely to find data sets from, uh, particularly from Ag Data Commons, not so much from gene banks here. Um, so to do this, to, to be able to enable this sort of view, um, you, you need somehow to harmonize a number of different metadata schemas. And this is where uh, uh, the, the, a lot of the work uh, that, that Pythagoras and Sotiris do, particularly for Guardian, uh, comes into play. So Guardian enriches the native metadata that comes in from uh, the repositories where the data sits uh, to enhance their fairness, particularly the focusing on the findability and accessibility. Um, so here's an example. This is, this is from one of our centers. Um, uh, uh, this is a publication from one of our centers, CIMIT. Um, and, and here, what, what, uh, what, what was done, when you look at this particular, uh, the same publication as it's viewed in Guardian, what, what's been done is a sort of a standardization of the, of the uh, first name, last name format of the authors from what you see here which is kind of you know, mixed, it's, it's not a consistent format, to a much more consistent format. Um, and then also a deduping. So, so this, this, same day, this same publication is available both from the, from the DFID um, repository as well as CIMIT's repository. We've deduped it and made it uh, uh, you know, consistently available just from this one place. If you go further down in that same publication, you see a set of keywords. And these keywords um, are, are both keywords that have been input typically by uh, the, the information and data managers, uh, but as it's been enriched as well uh, by pulling from Agrivoc as well as ontologies. And so that's, that's something that's uh, very powerful and enhances the, the findability and accessibility of data. This is another example. Uh, which, which shows you here uh, a data set from, um, actually not a data set, it's a publication from ICRISAT, one of our other centers in India. Um, and here you see um, an enhancement of, of the resource um, using geonames. So it's, it's, it, the, the, this was something that was absent in the original uh, publication sitting in the repository. Uh, the metadata enrichment uh, algorithms that are used by Guardian allowed this to, to happen using calling on geonames. 
And the last example I want to uh, give you is, is sort of, uh, again, the keywords that are enriched here. Um, this is a data set now, that's, that's an ICRISAT data set. Uh, uh, again, the, the center that's based in India. And at the bottom of this, you see a keyword cloud um, as you did before. In this case, the, the, the words here are drawn from both Agrivoc and ontologies. The earlier example I showed you was Agrivoc. Um, and, and where the ontologies particularly come into play, even, sometimes they're behind the scenes, they're not necessarily part of this cloud, uh, but, but they very much play a role in making data further discoverable, say to Google data. So it's, it's quite important in, in, in making the data fair, not only within Guardian, but much uh, beyond that, in increasing the, the, the discoverability of uh, uh, data more widely, data assets more widely. So this is my last slide. I just want to talk quickly about some of the challenges that the team has faced, um, this IO team, in, in enriching, in, in, in using these kinds of approaches. And of course, one of them is, is harmonization in the, in, in the harvesting and the harmonization step. So uh, here for CGIR particular, particularly, we, we do use a consistent metadata schema that's um, a, a sort of a, a, an extension of Dublin Core. Um, but there are differences in interpretation of labels. And even if the metadata schema used by our, our uh, partners who we, who we harvest from uh, maps to, to, to Dublin Core, um, it, it, it is a difficult proposition as has been referred to in earlier presentations. I talked a little bit about deduping records. Um, so that can be sort of a, 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 you know, we have to be careful about doing that as well. Uh, the quality and the richness of metadata uh, uh, is both of them are, are quite highly variable. So, so the, you know, for instance, um, for for uh, in so, in some instances you might see words. In some in other instances you see something close to sentences or paragraphs in the keywords field, which makes it a difficult proposition to know how to deal with. Um, and then of course there's uh, in, in 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 some for some records um, the the metadata. Uh, is quite rich, and in others, it's it's very poor. There there are you know just the most basic metadata available. So that there, the text mining approaches that are used by our algorithms um, are become even more important. Uh, with automated enrichment comes a sort of a pitfall as well. So there's the potential for misinterpretation. Uh, for instance, I, I came across a um, a data set, a spatial a data set about spatial data, and they talked in the abstract about grid cells, but that was being interpreted by our algorithms as cells. And so when you clicked on the, on the cells in, the, in that cloud in the, of the keywords, what you, got, what you saw was a bunch of stuff on organismal, you know, the biological equivalent of cells, which is not what this was about at all. So, so there's a danger there as well. And then the, the, the one, you know, does one size fit, fit all? And it doesn't typically, because here we're talking largely about um, um, a, a variety of scales, all the way from the genetic to the landscape. Um, and in terms of disciplines, all the way from the genomics to, or the omics types of disciplines uh, to socioeconomics, to spatial data, and there, uh, you know, it's it's always a sort of a tussle, um, and and compromises are involved in terms of the the metadata, and enriching that, of course, has its own special um, challenges and pitfalls, as you can imagine. So that's um, pretty much all I wanted to say. I wanted to give you a flavor of how we approach this um, at CGIR, um, and I'm happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Thank you, Mida. Um, excellent. So we move to our last um, presentation. Um, and this is uh, it's going to be delivered by Laura Mejolaro. She is the team leader of the LAM Portal Foundation, and she's responsible for the overall management, implementation, and expansion of the LAM Portal. I will be passing the slides on behalf. Um, Laura, just let me know, Laura, when uh, you want me to move the... Thank you, Emma. Slides. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for this opportunity. First of all, I just wanted to say that I um, introduce also my colleague Carlo Tejo, who created these slides with me, and we will be presenting uh, together. Uh, thank you so much. So next slide, please. Let me introduce uh, quickly who we are. The Lampoda Foundation is a small Dutch non-profit organization. Um, uh, we've been working over uh, the last 10 years to address the extreme fragmentation of land data, uh, providing a free and open information 
uh, for for a rather small community. So the land sector, uh, the land governance sector is a very specialized sector within the agricultural domain. Um, and I, I, according to it, so they have very uh, special needs. So according to uh, land researchers and practitioners, uh, so access to land is key for nutrition and food security and increases investment, agriculture productivity and improves people's livelihood. So, so access to land is at the heart of this small specialized community. I, I'm not, um, I mean, our, our um, numbers are much smaller than, <laughs> than those of my previous colleagues, but I just, just wanted to um, let you understand what what a um, what audience and what uh, community we are serving. So when it comes to access to data and information, it, it's proved to be very close close sector. The vast majority of land governance data remains closed, fragmented, poorly organized, with poor metadata and, and many times with no metadata at all. So they represent an uh, if, if you search for land information on the web, you, you can find only few information providers. So this means a very narrow range of perspectives and content kept to be published in a way that is not, doesn't facilitate discovery, discovery engagement and reuse. So because land is a cross cutting uh, issue and very, um, politicize. So analyzing land governance often means looking at not only different data types, but also dif across different domains. So it, it also involves um, looking at different data stakeholders. So, so not only academia, so the research data, but also the data provided by governments, um, civil society or private sector, um, uh, data providers, so different with different degrees of data capabilities. So our response to this extreme, extremely um, uh, fragmentation and, and accessibility of information is twofold. So on one hand, we develop and nurture a multilingual platform, landporza.org, that hosts a wide range of um, organized country issue and data set pages where we aggregate and pool content data um, of different types, such as bibliographic data, uh, statistical indicators, uh, um, spatial layers. Uh, we create a repository of uh, experts and sector organizations, media content, uh, especially from Southern uh, countries. And on the other hand, we, try to build capacity, data capacity in the sector and also um, um, a data infrastructure. So in a few years, the land port has become a leading online destination for data and information in the sector. So we have three main um, systems. Um, we have a geo portal that aggregates spatial layers, a Drupal website that aggregates uh, bibliographic data and media content and a triple store for statistical data. For the purpose of this presentation, we will mainly focus on the land library. That is a Drupal instance where we maintain and create a repository of land governance related resources pulled from multiple sources and which the metadata and map to semantic standards. So next slide, please. This is our uh, land library. So it includes Again, uh, for us, it's, it's a big number, 61,500 selected resources, but I recognize that it's a very small number compared to uh, previous uh, repositories. But is um, this content is uh, either published directly by our community of users or ingested through automatic um, importers. Most are metadata. Um, but uh, sometimes we, we, we upload the, the, the PDF, the resource as well. So as, as you can see, it's, um, it's a very a small and, uh, repository that select uh, content for a specialized community of uh, experts speaking different languages from different geographies. So we pull resources from uh, a number of uh, different sources and uh, improve the quality of native metadata. And at the same time, we also encourage partners to publish metadata and better metadata. So in our library, we adopt a customized version of the 
meaningful uh, bibliographic metadata, M2B, to provide users even more um, um, information about the, the, the resources that exist in the, in the library. So this um, custom adjustments to the M2B um, include, for instance, making some fields mandatory, such as the, uh, the subject field, um, and, and mainly because we also create um, a, a, a semantic set, set of uh, control vocabulary on land, which is part of Agrovoc. I will explain in a few minutes. So we also assure the quality of this metadata by including license, language, geographical focus that is very important for our audience. And for the value of the metadata fields, we use standard codes, such as the the, the ISO 300, 3166 one alpha three codes for countries or the UNM 49 code for areas and regions. And as I said before, for the subjects, we use Agrovoc. And in particular, um, a sub um, schema of Agrovoc called Landvoc is a small um, 300 um, set of keywords or concept highly relevant to the small sector that we serve. Um, so we contributed uh, developing Landvoc and maintaining uh, Landvoc within Agrovoc. Up to my colleague now that explains the data flow. Thank you very much. Uh, so in the next slide. So here uh, in this slide, I want to show you how data flow uh, when we import information from third parties into the land portal. So at the beginning, uh, we have the sources. Sources that could be very different from manual generated Excel file that um, follows a structure that is shared in the, in the land portal website to a JSON response from a, from a CMS as, as WordPress uh, or a XML response from a DSpace, for instance, the DSpace API. So we have this as the source. In the, in the middle, we, we have uh, what we call uh, the importers that are piece of software that mapping, uh, they map two things. We need to map the fields itself so a field in the source should be a field in the um, in the LAMP portal uh, metadata, it could be some of them. And also we need also to, to map the values because uh, we are using several close lists in the LAMP portal and we need to do some kind of mapping between the two, the two values. And finally, in order to ingest this information into the LAMP portal author, that is a Drupal website, we use the fit important feature. And during this whole process, during the whole process, um, there are tasks of data curation. So if we um, we see that there is an issue with uh, with the metadata or with a value, we contact uh, directly our partners, our the data providers, in order to raise this potential issue. Um, something that is important to highlight that it's in, in the LAMP portal, we are trying to not uh, host PDFs, we are not trying to host the publications, we are always trying to uh, point back to the source and we only try to collect the, the metadata, not the PDFs. So in the next slide, we can see some of the challenge that uh, we, are, we are facing. As uh, my previous colleagues mentioned, I think that is more or less the same, that um, we have very different sources. So as, as um, we need to deal with different uh, sources, um, some common challenge arise. So the first thing is to find relevant, uh, relevant information uh, because our sector is really small. So trying to find information is, is not easy. Uh, after that, it was, okay, this source is, is interesting. I have relevant uh, information. So what can we do? How many documents this source have? So if, if there are too many, maybe we can go to a machine approach, uh, working with some kind of software uh, Python importers, or maybe we need just to, to fill uh, the metadata and a spreadsheet and ingest it. And uh, well, 
the CMSs that uh, the content management systems that are behind uh, uh, the organizations, the data providers are very different uh, in terms of um, of the um, CMS itself, or maybe it could be a, an HTML page, and also the version. Uh, and uh, working with different CMS and different versions make us the, to change the, the approach each time. And also the type of uh, format, the data format of the source it could be like RPF, CSV, XML, JSON files, RIS, very different. Also the metadata mapping, we need to do one by one. Okay, this field, imagine that uh, in the sort we have um, uh, a DC contributor, maybe in our website could be or should be uh, an author. We need to do this kind of mapping and also the data values. Um, another challenge that we have is the multilingualism, uh, mainly for the data curation because uh, we can understand more or less uh, some languages, but other languages are out of the scope and sometimes you don't know if uh, there is a problem or not in the in the quality of the data. Um, last to mention is the, that we use a Lambok as uh, for tagging the content and not only for tagging the content, we are on, also using uh, Lambok that is a subset of uh, a concept of agrobock also for harvesting in order to find um, relevant sources. So trying to map sometimes uh, the source to this Lambok is, uh, is a challenge. And now I give uh, back the floor to my colleague Laura. Well, next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, we learned that what we learned over the past 10 years is this is a very a challenging sector because it's absolutely uh, fragmented. In data information is, is, is highly fragmented and enclosed in silos. So what we usually recommend to our data partners is to, to uh, have an, uh, an open as default mindset and follow third principle. So the capacity development is as important as maintaining and curating um, uh, common open repositories. Uh, we, we, we recommend to use standards in data and in metadata uh, to ensure that data met, metadata model um, establish channel for, for continued feedback and collaboration with our partners. So it's more a partnership rather than um, as serving uh, uh, kind of uh, an audience. But one of the most important lessons that we learn over the past years is that collaboration is key. So collaborating with um, like-minded organizations, like those that are sitting in this panel uh, today in the sector is, is very important. Joining forces to improve accessibility of scientific literature, promoting the use of standards, uh, spread best practices, um, promote and build capacity development. Um, and, and then also another key lesson is uh, building on, on what already exists without reinventing uh, um, things like uh, reusing existing semantic vocabularies, for instance, and build communities of practice around uh, those standards to the help improving, constantly improving and promoting them. This, this is very important. It's one of the most important lessons I wanted to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura, and thank you so much, Carlos. So I think that we are, uh, and thank you to all the panelists. I think that you did a great job. It's uh, six uh, to six here in, in the European Eastern time. I presume it's 12.06 in Washington, DC. So uh, thank you so much to all of you. So we can start now uh, what we call the questions and answers. Um, I haven't seen too many questions from the audience, um, but I will encourage you once again that if you have any um, any kind of um, yeah question to, to to for any of the panelists, please use the chat box, and, uh, and we will answer as soon as possible. In the meantime, I have some questions for you, for all our panelists. And uh, I, was, uh, I would like to put them on the table and perhaps 
to have a kind of a round and to know a little bit what all of you think about, um, I mean, uh, these, uh, these topics. I, I think that in some cases you already mentioned uh, how crucial to recommend and, and to promote good practices is, um, are, let's say, in, in our domain as much as it happens as well in other domains. But what recommendations specifically you think that we could provide to organizations uh, to enhance this visibility of their resources through the improvement of the quality of metadata? What kind of steps would you suggest more specifically that we could do to help them or what you would recommend to them? I think, Laura, you were very specific in your presentation right now, talking about a specific community that you are targeting. But maybe do you want to expand a little bit more what you mentioned before? about these kind of recommendations that you are preparing, for instance, workshops or um, publications, videos? Yes, of course. Um, as I mentioned, the building capacities um, goes hand in hand with building the, the, the sector infrastructure. So uh, on one hand, we work with the, the AgriVoc team to develop LandVoc as part of, of the general infrastructure, and then we, on the other hand, we build capacity through uh, MOOCs or workshops or tutorials for people to improve their um, knowledge management capacity or their data management capacity. So we encourage them to, to, to create metadata, to enrich their metadata, to uh, expose their metadata in the right way, to use standards in their metadata fields. Um, that's, and, and building a community that supports those best practices is, is very important um, from, from different uh, sectors. So in the, in the, in the LandVoc community of experts, for instance, we welcome um, uh, leaders from civil society organizations or a representative of, of government organizations or, or researchers from universities. So all with different needs and, and slightly different perspectives, but we want core uh, idea in mind that the sharing data is very important uh, to improve uh, land governance. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Meta, would you like to add something about uh, lessons learned on these sites uh, from sure. your experience and long experience with researchers and CGIR? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I can tell you a few things. Um, <laughs> I'll keep my remarks clean though. Um, so so I, I, I echo what Laura said. I mean, I think it's really important to work um, within the community, uh, a community and across com communities. So one of the things that we're doing is, is to work uh, within communities of practice. Uh, and that helps to train and, and build capacity within our own communities of practice. In this case, uh, it could be data managers and information specialists across CGIR but more broadly, even beyond CGIR. So, so anything that we do uh, will be open to, to others as well. Um, part of this focuses around capacity building, as, as Laura mentioned. A lot of it is also about culture change. So with, when you're working with researchers, um, you know, the, 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 I was going to mention the third thing, which is tools and services, but really the biggest rub is the culture. Um, and that's what you have to change. Um, and, and to do that, there, there are multiple ways in which we, we're trying to do that. One is to, to, to build the capacity, to, to build the, the tools, um, to, to answer the question of what's in this for me, that the researchers need to sort of effectively understand and, and respond to, um, and basically to incentivize the, the proper annotation and the proper handling, the proper management of our data assets, why, you know, more broadly speaking. Um, that takes many forms. It could be through, uh, you know, how researchers are rewarded. Let's get away from the model where people are rewarded only for, you know, high impact factor publications. This is a message we're consistently trying to push out. Um, how are you managing your data? How fair is the data? We've got metrics now to kind of, you know, put a quantitative um, stamp on how fair data is so that you can start to now incentivize it more broadly through um, annual evaluations, for instance, of researchers, of scientists. Um, be, you know, putting in place rewards, having data sprints that, that our data managers and information specialists organize on a pretty routine level, uh, hackathon, you know, curathons, they call them data curathons and, and data sprints where researchers are able to come in, spend two hours or half a day, um, with very much hands-on, uh, you know, help 
to make, to annotate their data assets better. So these are all pieces that we need to put in place combined with the tools and the services such as the fair workflows that I mentioned earlier, which will help um, researchers in the agricultural space particularly annotate their data consistently and very easily. Uh, the idea is to make it easy and, and you know, let, let researchers, uh, you know, be able to, to, to do that that way. So many different approaches, I would say. I see Erin agreeing with all the things that you are saying. Erin, would you like to say something else about that? Yes, um, that's the incentivization, just trying to convince people to produce better metadata is, is huge because when you're uploading data files, if you don't have good metadata, you don't know what that is and no one can reuse it. And a lot of times researchers they're so strapped for time that they don't, it's an afterthought. Metadata is an afterthought. And then at that point, once they get their publication, they, they're just scrambling to go on to the next thing. And so we're trying to build it into um, the process so that it's maybe more from the beginning, like with date, the USDA, first of all, um, we are now um, re required to have data management plans. So they have to start thinking about where they're going to put their data and how they're going to share their data and all of that, what, what they're going to produce, what standards they're going to use at the beginning before they even get the grant. And so that is, we're hoping that that helps to increase just their thinking about it, that they're, they're thinking about it, they're coming up with that plan and that it's built into their culture. It is a culture change and, you know, unless it's, in, in, unfortunately in those cases, unless it's mandated, a lot of people won't do it because they don't have the time and they look at that metadata form. And then the other, the other step is for us to make it more accessible for them. So they see a huge metadata form and they get intimidated. And we are also offering webinars and, and tutorials and one-on-one -on -one sessions and group sessions to help educate people and take the, take the shock out of it when they see that. Right. I may I add just one word? I, what Erin is saying about culture is absolutely important. So the, 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 the idea of sharing data is absolutely an attitude. And we notice that people, for instance, they don't think about the license of, of, of their data. And if they don't put any license, that's, that's closed by default. So, but they don't put the license just because they don't think about it, not, just, not because sometimes they don't want to share the data. So it's really a, a change in the attitude of how people deal with data. And they don't think about, uh, and uh, sharing a, a, a data management plan before they start working on a publication. When they finish a publication, they think their job is done. And, and, and they don't realize that if they don't share it, they don't make it open, mm -hmm. then it's, it's not really useful. Right. Fabrizio, I don't know whether you would like, you had a, a specific slide about all these, but I don't know whether you would like to add something more. Yes, I would like to add something. I really agree about uh, the rich, the asking for rich metadata and especially to make that available. But I want to add something about uh, the technology. So I think that in this sector we are very late. We are still talking about uh, uh, sharing the data and making data available while that should be given for granted. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee 20 years ago was talking about uh, publishing your data, make raw data available, and so over. Now we live uh, in the area of uh, the technology. So what we should really think is not only sharing the data, but it's sharing the data in a way that machines can do a better job with the data. So for example, using standard metadata properties, of course, allows a machine to better understand what's going on without using very sophisticated algorithms that need training data sets and uh, specialized IT knowledge then, for example, also relying on vocabularies, uh, existing vocabularies, or aligning your vocabulary with existing vocabularies uh, can help, of course, uh, connecting resources, can help data discovery, can help data representation. So the usage of uh, vocabularies, URIs, the ones that are alignments, then uh, we solve a lot of issues uh, with understanding the meaning of the data, with the possibility to link things together. Uh, and then uh, when you publish the data, for example, on a website, uh, uh, the possibility to annotate uh, pages uh, with schema.org uh, and using metadata so that search engines can understand uh, what's going on in your website. Uh, or if you have an API, like document your API in a machine readable way or using tools like Swagger 
So overall, I understand that uh, we have uh, 20 years of delay because uh, we still have to face uh, with problems related to making data available while uh, we should address uh, the next step, uh, the next uh, series of problems like making data available for machines. So to solve a lot of other issues that we have now. Right, right. Carlos, I don't know whether you would uh, like to, to say something about what Fabrizio was mentioning. I saw that you were listening very carefully or yes. Mm, yeah. Just I was thinking about, uh, we were talking about a lot about reinventing the wheel all the time that we mm -hmm. don't reinvent the wheel, but we we're thinking more about not tripping on the same storm. And we are facing the same challenge, the same uh, different people in several places. So maybe mm -hmm. something that to think about is to have a kind of session about what are the lessons learned, and what are the uh, the, the actually the the the, the, um, the issues that arises in in every kind of integration. Because I think that Fabrizio and I. We, we we get the same errors from different places. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes if you have this lesson learned somewhere, you you will overcome these uh, these issues uh, faster, um, yeah, and quicker. Yeah. Right. So this brings me to to another question that is more about a suggestion. So because I see that we all have the same problems and in, in a very similar way. So I'm just thinking. What, um, what kind of next steps we could take as leaders of, of, of important information systems in agricultural sciences to join forces, to, to really uh, um, work on um, together to, 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 um, to, let's say, overcome with this, this, these challenges or there is any activity, do you think that we, there is any kind of a, um, context where you think that we could simply make sure that there is this duplication that even Carlos was mentioning in another area, but in general that we are finding ourselves in different areas um, could be shared. Lessons learned, sharing standardization of data. I saw a good walk all over the place, so what makes me very happy since uh, eventually um, I'm the AgriVoc manager and I'm working as well with NALT to uh, map both vocabularies, so this is very, very uh, important at the, uh, at the moment. But there is any anything that you think uh, that we could um, work together? I know that, for instance, uh, if I was working with Laura in doing capacity development activities, we are supporting uh, the LAMP portal as much as we can. Also, with INL, uh, we are working on this mapping I was mentioning. With NEDA, we are also working in some, some areas related to mapping ontologies in CIR, et cetera, et cetera. This is one of some of the areas, but do you have anything else in mind that you could, you think that we could do together to improve this situation that we put on the table today? I, I have a thought about that, and it actually relates in part to something someone just typed in the chat about um, dealing with rigorous standards and metadata standards for different um, subject areas. And that's one challenge that we have. We're dealing with genomics data and life cycle assessment data and ge geospatial data, and it's all ag related. But um, in the ag cross example that I showed in my, in my slide, maybe finding ways to find where the subject specific um, people are keeping their data and finding ways to standardize it in order to make it more findable, but then to point back so that they don't have to necessarily conform to one standard. And I think Medha mentioned this in her presentation that we can't, it, it, you can't make one, one size fits all, it doesn't. And so what we should be doing is trying to figure out who's searching, what are they trying to accomplish, and then getting together and figuring out how we can facilitate that. So whether it's using a standard vocabulary to integrate um, into one platform that people can search and then go off into their subject specific, um, maybe something to something like that. I mean, we do that to a lesser degree. I mean, we're focusing on US 
United States data, USDA data specifically, but um, some of you are aggregating what we collect. And so yeah. if we can feed into that, I would love to know what would make it easier as you're taking in our data to make it more discoverable you know, on a larger platform. Right, okay. Do you have um, any other comments, Meda, Fabrizio, Laura, Carlos? Sure. I mean, one of the things that occurs to me is here we have, you know, some of the you know, fairly, some fairly important platforms in, in agriculture um, and repositories. I and mean, we could rope in a few others, perhaps World Bank, for instance, and a, and a couple of other entities. Uh, but it would, it would perhaps be helpful to together develop um, a framework or a set of principles that, that we stamp with, with our presence, essentially, with our organizational uh, presence and, and float out there as, as sort of guidelines, um, along with attached tools that, that people can choose from. It doesn't have to be your tool or my tool. We don't have to choose among them, but we, we make, make it possible for people to not only see what, what best practice really might be, or is really, but but also how do I actually make it simple for me? You want me to do this? You tell me how to do it, and I'll do it. You know that that sort of approach needs to be uh, could could perhaps be helpful. Um, the other thing I would say is you know in terms of in incentivization, one of the things that we're doing um, that that I'm trying to figure out how, how this group could work um, together on is one of the things we're trying to do is show researchers what the value is of well described data. What can data science do for you? And so one of the, you know, one of the sort of the small projects that the big data platform funded through the organized module is, uh, you know, answering the broad question of, you know, is fertilizer used really, really um, profitable in Africa? We all go with the assumption that it actually increases yields, but does it actually uh, translate to profit? And if so, where? And so this was done using Guardian. Uh, they, you know, the, the researchers, a team of three, primary researchers found uh, 200 data sets in Guardian, 760 locations, and they were able to put, you know, uh, use machine learning over this kind of data pool, this, these data points, um, to derive some insight and, and actually found that it's not always, um, you know, even where yields are very high, profits can be very low because it depends, of course, as you might expect on, on uh, market value of the, of the crop, uh, on, on the price of fertilizer, et cetera. So, being able to pool all of these data and spatially, you know, um, identify where where fertilizer is useful is one of the key things that we, sh you know, that's that's sort of a key question mm -hmm. for for um, African agriculture, and and we can do that. Uh, and and once researchers see this kind of thing being done, they get really excited about it. So can we then, uh, you know, with these growing data pools, come up with these kinds of use cases? That would be very interesting, I think, in terms of changing hearts and minds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Oh no. This uh, this example is uh, it's very it's very nice, and I think that this is the last uh, step of of the chain because as far as I see now, there are two 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 different groups. So there are the producers of the data, and uh, as we are saying, uh, we can ob oblige them to use a common standard, a common format. They produce the data as they can produce it. What we can do as aggregators, uh, and Agris is doing already that, but we can always do it better, is to do capacity development with them. When we receive the data with wrong metadata in the, in the wrong places, so for example, there is the alternative title and you find there the journal title, you have to tell them that this is, this is not working. So this is the, the first thing that we can do, work uh, with the producer of the data and uh, uh, help them to produce something better. All the rest uh, is up to us. So uh, the harmonization of the data, the metadata enrichment, we have to, to do an effort. Sometimes we cannot do a joint effort because everybody has uh, their own way to, to, to be funded. So we are also guided by what we find outside. But what we could do is to, to work together to like recommendations that we can use uh, that we can use all together when it's time to harmonize the data when it's time to give some uh, not truths but recommendations to publish the data and to make that available because then at that point there is the third step that Meda was saying and all this will help the usage of the data to discover to create new knowledge and to dis to discover new things. Yeah. 
But as aggregators, we have a responsibility to guide the data providers and between us, uh, even if uh, there can be like uh, political and institutional problems to, to at least uh, write down some guidelines that we can all follow. Well, we, we belong to a very small um, community. So uh, we always, um, uh, we always um, had a major, uh, benefits from collaboration, collaborating with other um, uh, aggregators and within a wider so, sector like the agriculture sector. I certainly welcome the idea of developing common tools or guidelines facilitate, to facilitate the interoperability and raise awareness. Um, and, and to me, it's, it's also a matter of um, making um, I mean, one of the incentives, for instance, in my opinion, is really demonstrate what the consequences of a closed data environment are, what a closed data environment will look like, and why a more um, interoperable uh, data environment is, is then more democratic. So this is a kind of a, the, um, the argument that we bring to the table all the time is um, making data visible, interoperable means uh, making the data landscape more democratic mm -hmm. and diverse. We are almost finishing the panel session, but I just realized that there is a question from Meda that uh, says, can you say more about your metrics for how fair the data is? Yeah, so um, I, I saw that and I pulled up, uh, I'm sharing my screen again just to show you how we do this. Um, so, so this is the, the Guardian landing page, guardian.bigdata.cgr.org. If you go to About Guardian, or if you do a search in Guardian, um, every, every resource, you'll see a fair metrics uh, link to. And, and you can go to, sorry, to analytics here. And when you go to analytics, you see something about, um, you know, fairness across, particularly across CGIR. But you can go to view metrics here, and it tells you a little bit about how we're actually scoring for fair. And, and basically what that amounts to is that we're using, um, if I click on that download, the, the, the guide, we've got a guide here, a step-by-step -step sort of blow-by-blow -blow guide on how you get to zero from zero to level five for, for all of these things, for F, A, I, and R. Um, so this is what we've tried to use in, in terms of how we score. Uh, it's built on the on the Netherlands uh, archive for its dance. I can never remember what it stands mm -hmm. for. It's somewhere here. Permanent access to digital research resources, dance, uh, roughly translated. So we've used their metrics to, to develop these algorithms. And so each data asset in Guardian is scored uh, that way. We're changing our, our interface. So you'll see something like this now with a very large data management toolkit. And if you go to that, to that toolkit, um, at the very bottom, for instance, you, you'll see, you can browse them. And so if you go to data curation, you'll see the FAIR data guidelines here. And the FAIR data workflow uh, will be available soon as well there in another couple of weeks. Thank you so much, Meda. This brings us to the end of the session. I would really like to thank to all the panelists for such a nice one hour and a half. I have really enjoyed to list, listening to all of you. And I hope that uh, attendees also enjoyed this, um, this session as well. As you have seen, this is just the beginning of something else. So we hope that perhaps in another time, uh, we will uh, talk more about what we, we are going to do together as we were putting on the table today. So thank you to everybody. Thank you as well for the organizers of DCMI and for giving to us this opportunity. It's very